Hi, we're here to talk to you today about the MCP voluntary contract. I'm Carol Cusack, Director of Primary Care at Wessex LMCs. And I'm Nigel Watson, I'm a GP and Chief Executive of Wessex Local Medical Committees and I sit on the National Advisory Committee about the voluntary MCP contract. My first question Nigel um, is, can you tell me exactly what is an MCP? So an MCP was described in the forward view. It was a new model of care, it was about trying to bring the out of hospital model together, looking at community services, working much more closely with general practice, uh, individual practices having the registered list, but also general practice in the wider sense with the formation of federations and other organisations, looking at seeing where is the synergy between those organisations working together for the benefit of a defined population. Okay. And for those of us who hate acronyms, what does MCP actually stand for? It's a multi-specialty, community-based provider. And what it is, is about trying to develop the um, planning and the delivery of services, and ultimately where the MCP contract comes in, is actually having a budget to do this. At the moment we have commissioning, which does quite a lot of planning, it tells people what services they want and how they'll deliver the service, and then the contracting process can be very bureaucratic and difficult. Where we are at the moment, we've got general practice working in isolation from community services, from social care, from the voluntary sector, from hospitals. This is an aim of getting rid of some of those barriers and looking at the needs of a population and working together in a much more collaborative way. And moving forward, it's about saying, actually, rather than you just working about how you can work together, if you were given a budget and greater freedom in terms of how the service is commissioned for outcomes, could you develop and provide services in a better and more cost-effective way? Okay, so that really describes why we need one. Um, but then I've heard about the voluntary MCP um, contract. What, what's that? So this was described originally by the Prime Minister at the Tory party conference, and what it was saying was um, you can achieve quite a lot by working together, but if you want to take it to the next stage, and it's voluntary, people don't have to take this option up, but it is there for people that want to, mm -hmm. could you develop a contract which sat with the legal entity, which would then put various services together and give that legal entity the ability to hold a budget for a population to be able to deliver the outcomes and plan services across more than one provider. I mean, I've heard that if you went for that, you have to give up your GMS or PMS contract. Is that correct? That's absolutely not correct. There are many strengths to British general practice. Having the registered lists, um, being able to look at your individual population is one of the cornerstones of the NHS. If that fails, the rest of the NHS will fail. So we want to build on that, and that's why the voluntary contract has to have the registered list of general practice at the centre of it. Now, there are various ways of delivering that working together, and the three stages that you could do is, one is called a virtual MCP, so you don't need to change any contracts at all, but you agree to work together between general practice, community, the uh, local authority, potentially voluntary sector and hospitals, and you work out between you how you will deliver services in a different way. So the GMS, PMS contract remains exactly the same as it is now. The next stage could be what's called a partially integrated model. And what you do by that is you have a defined legal entity, um, and that could be a limited liability partnership, it could be a limited company, it could be an NHS foundation trust, or an NHS trust, or a community interest company and that could be a number of people working together within that joint venture. And that could hold a contract for those community services that are part of the voluntary MCP contract, but doesn't mean that the GMS-PMS needs to be fully integrated with it. Practices could work in that environment without any change to their PMS and GMS contract as it stands at the moment. So you mentioned it could be a, a CIC, some sort of legal entity. Can a, 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 a locality, a practice federation, could they hold one of these contracts? They, they could and that then leads into the sort of ultimate stage for some people which is you could have a fully integrated model and with that you could put your GMS or PMS contract on hold for a couple of years and work in a much more integrated way so that the MCP actually holds the PMS or GMS contract mm -hmm. um, and then 
practices deliver the service. So you don't change primary care in the sense of general practice, how it's delivered, but you just give it more flexibility. So GMS and PMS, there is no danger of that contract disappearing or practices being made to give it up. Okay. So what happens then? Let's say you've got a locality and you've got 10 practices and eight of them say, yeah, this is for us, we like to work like that, and the other two don't want to. Does that scupper the whole deal? No. Um, you can, if you're looking at a population, so in any of the three methods I've described, basically practices need to be engaged in the process. Yeah. But if one or two practices say, look, we're really busy, we don't want to be involved in this, the rest of the organisations could work together and deliver outcomes to that population with those two practices providing general medical services as they do now, but a lot of the stuff about population, about integration, about breaking the barriers down could be done on their behalf. So they don't need to be fully signed up and say, yeah, we absolutely um, agree with everything that's being done. But those eight practices working together, potentially with federations, with the community, need to be mindful of services delivered to the whole population, not the whole population excluding those two practices. Right. Yeah, okay, got it. Um, how, how long is one of these contracts? How long will they last for? They are going to be for 10 to 15 years. Okay. It's very early stages, so we've had the framework published um, recently and the contract will be published in September with the intention that these will be planned for, um, procured and be put in place for April next year. The first couple of years there will inevitably be a period of bedding in and evolution with break clauses to allow this to evolve and develop. But if we're going to make these contracts work, they can't be put in place for a year or two, they have to be longer. Yeah, absolutely. So how will they be funded? So if you look at how services are funded at the moment, whether they're community services, some of the services that are currently based in hospitals, so some outpatient services, um, frailty, etc., you would look at the budget for those services and put them into a single budget held by this legal entity. Mm, good. Um, so what actually is included in the contract? So there are flexibilities within it. So one of the things that's been publicised are the QOF and enhanced services, also about the incentives that are provided to secondary care, the sequins. Mm. And you could potentially look at different ways of delivering um, incentives to meet the things that the uh, MCP is trying to do. So the funding for QOF, for example, could be uh, part of practices basic funding, but what you do is then you put in a number of incentives which look at delivering outcome-based measures which are different from QOF. Now that's already been tried in Somerset and one or two other places and you could do that within an MCP. The same with enhanced services, rather than having 15 or 20 enhanced service contracts, you could just bundle it all up into one service and get practices to deliver that. So it's... It so is it a complete national contract or is there a lot of local flexibilities that, that can be built in? There's local flexibility, so there will be, the framework's been published, the, the contract will be you know, as the NHS standard contract is, mm. but there will be flexibility in what the commissioners are looking to provide within one of these contracts. So you know, a prerequisite is to have the GMS, PMS registered list, so practices need to be part of it, it can't, it can't be delivered without them. The second stage is having community services, so working with community providers and integrating with them so that you don't have a separate service for general practice and community nursing, community therapy. You start working in a much more integrated way. You could then add other bits into it, so the things that have been talked about are looking at certain outpatient specialties which should be delivered in the community, so diabetes, respiratory care, care of the frail elderly, palliative care, but also things like diagnostics, um, which could appropriately be delivered through an entity like this, or even things like daycare surgery. So there's a number of options, which would be a discussion and debate at a locality level with both practices, federations, uh, community providers and CCGs. Okay. So in terms of an MCP then, a voluntary contract, what happens in terms of indemnity, CQC? So one of the things that's been published is that you know, indemnity is becoming increasingly expensive and makes recruitment and retention difficult. 
if you sit within uh, a legal entity that holds an MCP contract, as NHS trusts do, hospitals do, they have an indemnity scheme that's delivered in a different way to the normal medical defence organisations. So the potential there is that a legal entity could have indemnity for the clinicians that work within that organisation. In terms of CQC, um, there could be one inspection for the MCP. So that's part of the new models of care in developing services and not just about NHS England, but also include Health Education England, Public Health England and CQC as one of the regulators. Oh, right. Okay. When does it all start? So the, the start date is the evolution is happening now. Six of the areas are working on the context of the, of the voluntary contract. Um, in September that contract will be published mm -hmm. and then commissioners and providers will be working together over the next few months for a start date of the 1st of April 2017. Okay. Well, I'll say thank you. Is there anything you've forgotten to say? I think I've covered most of the things. Oh yeah, what, actually one thing I just forget <laughs> yeah, to talk about. Would be. <laughs> um, there has been publication about um, if these voluntary contracts were put in place, there is an absolute requirement to reduce hospital admissions. And if they are not yes, reduced, then 10% of the income is put at risk. And quite naturally, practices would be concerned that 10% of their practice funding to deliver services could be taken away. That is absolutely not the case. Yes, if we're going to look at better use of resources, we need to look at a balance between what is delivered in the community and what is delivered in the hospital. What's happened over the last six to seven years is the demand in hospital has risen and because of the system of payments, payment by result or payment by activity, we've invested more and more into hospital-based care. If we're going to provide different services in the community, then that's got to look at how we, within a defined budget, make the best use of that. So we do need to look at hospital admissions, accident and emergency attendances, but with an ageing population, unless we invest in a community-based model, the rise on hospital Based care and the reliance on that isn't going to change. So we do need to do that. But there isn't a 10% that's going to be deducted if you don't hit those targets. So, you know, for practices and within localities, I think this is a voluntary contract. It may be very useful for some areas, and there are areas that are keen to take this up. Some may say at this stage they don't want to do it. And I think some of this is about looking at the risks there are in it and what are the benefits, and if those balance so that there are more benefits than risks, then practices may want to do it. Part of our involvement in the advisory committee and other organisations is to try and maximise the benefits, but also minimise the risks, mm -hmm. because it is very different for a hospital trust or a community trust in terms of the risk they run with one of these contracts, compared to if a single practice held a contract where you put um, lots of things at yeah. risk and that's why working together in collaboration and putting it into a legal entity is probably a safer way of moving forward. Okay thank you. Note to self, specific questions, he's brief. Give him an open-ended thing like that, goes on forever. But thank you anyway Nigel, very clear. Thank you very much. <laughs>